Okay. okay. We are working. Um, let me go public. Publico. Publico. Make sure I get.
up to you. You need the Discord message they just sent. It's like He has been working here for a I don't know, but Sydney is not a very nice place to live. Well, of course, you're not the same. Alright, everyone, welcome. Um, this is the first technical talk of semester one. You should know that because we just started this in week one and this is probably the first time you've been in this room. Um, so tonight, or this afternoon, we have Henry here. Um, he's doing a master of cybersecurity. Um, mucks around with a lot of hardware stuff in his spare time vis-a-vis uh, -vis this talk. Uh, is that the correct usage? I have no idea. Um, anyway, um, he uh, does a lot of stuff in his spare time. Um, does a lot of stuff, it's very descriptive. Um, yeah, he mucks around with hardware a lot, as I said. Um, one of the projects he's worked on is he built his own keyboard. Didn't just build it like um, ordering the parts online or anything. Built it from scratch. Um, I don't know how to do that, but luckily we have him here to tell us how. So, um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Henry, who's going to teach us how to make a keyboard from scratch. Thanks, Henry. All right, All right so, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm the presenter for today. Uh, welcome to your first talk for the semester. So um, today's talk is about um, providing an insight into the journey um, where you take your idea of a keyboard and then you realize it. Um, of course, you can throw whatever feature you like. Um, that's totally fine. It's up to you. So um, first, I'm going to talk about what this talk isn't about. So um, you don't need um, deep technical knowledge in electrical engineering. Um, you don't need your circuit simulation knowledge. You don't need your um, physical knowledge, electronics, you don't need your signal processing knowledge, you don't need any of that. Um, it's very streamlined, it's very simplified, and hopefully um, at the end of this talk, you guys will have like an idea of how to actually start your, uh, start your prototype. Um, there's not going to be any design bashing, no holy wars. Um, me personally, I don't care about any of these um, funny sounds that your keyboards make or the funny feeling that your keyboards have or your difference in switches. Um, that's all um, subjective. Okay, so um, I'm not going to introduce to you um, many automated tools because now that keyboard making is so streamlined, um, there are many people that have made like um, from start to finish um, all the tooling that you need. Um, it will not help you much in your troubleshooting process, so um, I tend to avoid that. I will also not um, attempt to define a strict methodology because it's your idea. You, you can like jump from step one to step five, jump to step two. Um, that's your, it's your process. You own it. And um, unfortunately, this is a prototype, so you can't sell your stuff. Um, immediately because there's all sorts of certification that you need to um, undergo before your product is suitable for the market. Um, there's also a lot of um, a very serious problem which is um, electromagnetic uh, interference. So um, this talk is not going to tell you how to do that because those are entire courses and degrees on how to actually fix that problem. And uh, unfortunately I'm not going to talk about keycaps because keycaps are also a totally different field. Um, from this. However, um, what I will go through is what to consider in your design. So from your very first stage, once you take your idea and start to distill it, um, your usability, your practicality in, your, in terms of engineering and the constraint that, that you should consider. Because if you um, don't start this process of um, refining all this early, um, your cost to, make, to making the prototype will just gradually increase because of the number of errors that you make. And errors in the prototyping phase can be really costly. Um, so I'll talk about how and where to begin starting the CAD process, um, CAD, which is computer-aided design. 
and I will also introduce to you some of the manufacturers who can turn your ideas into your product. And also, of course, corner mistakes avoid and some helpful resources and facilities that you can access. Um, okay, it's, it's not really prerequisite, it's more like good to know, good to have um, some soldering knowledge um, because you'll be working a lot with your um, PCB, your printed circuit board. Um, some C, knowledge of C will be very good, so if we have taken 2310 and survived the baptism of fire, good for you. Um, tiny bit of electronics and of course time and money. So as I explained earlier, um, each external party that you grab into your process, each service and each mistake that you make is going to add on to your cost. Um, of course, at the end of the talk, I'll give a little bit of a breakdown on how much I spent when I uh, made this thing. And of course, don't do this. Please, please don't hold a solder like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the general roadmap for, um, I guess, making almost anything. Um, first, you can start with your ideas, um, brainstorming, shower thoughts. Then we go into the um, EDA and CAD process. Um, I will explain um, this later on. And then we'll, after that, go to 3D modeling. So the 3D modeling part is actually where you start to check that your product um, is dimensionally accurate because you don't want to end up with a product that is like um, a few millimeters off or in the other, like ang your angles are different, stuff like that. And then finally, fabrication. So as you can tell like by all these um, back arrows and loop arrows, um, it's a constant and iterative process. But once you get to fabrication, that's like, it's sort of too late. You already have um, one version of your prototype. If you screw up that, then you have to restart the entire process again. Okay, so first we started brainstorming. Um, hopefully you don't end up with your prototype like burning up its magic smoke. So um, generally what goes into the keyboard, um, you have your looks, which is the general like theme of the keyboard, you, your color design and whatever. You have the ergonomics, the typing experience, um, you have the guts of your keyboard, the firmware, the layout, the um, gimmicks um, and features. So for example, for my keyboard, I put like a screen there because, just because I can and just because I felt like it. And then um, finally, you have the assembly um, and the materials and construction. So, um, naturally, like, the assembly is probably one of the most important things because if you design a keyboard that is really difficult to assemble, um, you're in for a hard time. Okay, so um, I guess most of you guys who have their own mechanical keyboards or are in like, this field, um, you already know about all these different kind of layouts. So, um, you can head over to this link, Keyboard University, it gives you an idea of like, almost anything that that keyboards look like or, or feel like nowadays. So um, there are keyboards that are like full size, that's the standard, uh, standard one. You have um, 10 keyless, which is a lack of your numpad, um, macro pads, um, split keyboards, wireless keyboards, and all sorts of, all sorts of uh, funky features. Then, um, of course, you also have your uh, different, uh, like, your knobs, your OLED screens, um, hot solvable keys, um, RGB, Bluetooth, whatever. So um, the last one, and key rollover, this is actually more of a software feature. So uh, this basically means that your keyboard is able to press more than six keys. So why six? This is uh, unfortunately a limitation of the USB stack. So um, there are certain ways to bypass it, but they have already done it in your firmware, so you don't have to deal with it much unless you roll your own firmware. Okay, so um, just a bit of terminology, I guess. Um, so you have your keycap, uh, it's a bit blocked by the display unfortunately, but that's your keycap and that's your switch. And then the standard switch has a fixed dimension of like 19.05 millimeters in a square. And um, so that also includes the bit of clearance, the little gap in between keys. So um, almost all of, of your design will be based off these um, base units. So um, from this, you be able to actually derive the rest of, of your keyboard's dimensions. And here we have Keyboard Layout Editor. This is probably like one of the most important tools that you can use to first generate like this, this thing, like a look of how your keyboard would be. 
um, if you need it to be split keyboard um, or you need to have like, for example, you, you feel like your keyboard should only have three rows, you can also do that. So um, that's totally up to you. Okay, so um, a bit of constraints. So your keyboard um, will, will require a certain number of inputs and your microcontroller, which is the little chip there, uh, has to be able to take in and handle that amount of inputs. So each analog component, like for example, if you decide to add a knob, um, you need an analog input. So you have to consult your data sheets um, of your microcontroller to figure out like what are the, what are the hard limits that you have. So um, you also need to consider that any additional active components such as a screen, um, or you need like you decide to have like your RGB uh, LEDs on your keyboard, you also need to consider their current requirements. So that's like, there's a maximum of about 500 milliamps. So um, you need to have your own calculation when you do that. If not, once you plug your keyboard in, it'll either smoke or it will stop working out. Okay, and also I think this is very important. While you're testing your keyboard, or while you're like bench testing it, please don't mix your voltages up. So, for example, if you put like a um, five volt signal into a three point three volt output, um, it will definitely die. Yeah. So, you need additional circuitry to help you if you need to bump your signals up from like three point three volts to five volts. Um, that's a bit more of a technical part. Uh, I'm not going to cover it today. Okay, so um, next we move on to the uh, bill of materials. Um, think of this as your shopping list for the um, electronics part. So it would be good if you could actually gather all of this information uh, as soon as possible and put it all into a nice list because um, this list will actually go toward like helping you in the uh, printed circuit board um, assembly phase. So um, things to consider are the number of switches you need if you need like encoders for your knobs, you need LEDs, you need passive components, you need microcontrollers or other things. So we'll move on to the microcontroller next. So this here is, I think it's a, some Arduino board. Yeah, so you can bench test your design before you actually um, start to make the, the printed circuit board for it. Um, ideally, um, this would help you to get a look and f uh, get a few of your um, capabilities of your microcontroller. Um, these I think cost maybe like ten to twenty bucks for um, for one breakout board like that. Um, and then you can um, program it using the Arduino IDE or whichever IDE that supports your um, microcontroller. However, if you decide to use um, like very um, obscure uh, microcontroller brands. Um, you have to look for the SDKs yourself because uh, that's where the support is. And of course, um, please don't short your positive and negative pins, your VCC and ground. Um, it will generate lots of bad things. Okay, so some of the, um, the products that are available on the market for you to use. Um, you can use the, I think everyone's familiar with Arduino. Um, TNC is actually a very popular uh, microcontroller manufacturer. They, um, their products actually are very good for um, handling um, human interface devices, so USB, USB controllers, or anything that has like you need the USB for. Um, they also have a very powerful, uh, like I think 600 megahertz core um, processor that you can use, but it's a bit overkill for a keyboard. Uh, you have um, STM, uh, ST Micro Electronics with their Bluefield. You have the ESP32s. So um, a note on the ESP32 is that the older models do not support uh, the USB being repurposed. So if you buy like a cheap ESP32, be warned that that can happen. And of course, now recently um, we have the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's getting um, it's gaining popularity. Um, it's dual core, so you can actually do a lot of things with it. Okay. So once your um, once you're actually moved off from the uh, bench testing phase and you're ready to put the microcontroller onto your uh, printed circuit board, you have to consider the following. Because usually when you buy a breakout board, um, all of this has been done for you and all you have 
access to are the pins. But if you have a chip alone, um, most of the time the chip doesn't come with a flash memory. So the flash memory is where your firmware will live inside. If you don't have flash memory, you have to consider um, buying one and putting it into your design. Um, does the chip support USB? So not all microcontrollers have the, um, they, not all microcontrollers natively support USB. Like some of them, they require um, additional circuitry or they need a serial connection that will convert it over to um, some other protocol that the chip understands. Um, you need communication interfaces if you need to talk to, for example, a screen. Um, so, like for example, you need I2C or you need uh, UART. And then, um, does the firmware um, support the chip out of the box? So, I think I'll talk about firmware next. So, all these de details can be found on the data sheet. So, when you are doing shopping for your microcontroller, consult the data sheet first. Okay, so um, the firmware is probably one of the most important things, if not your keyboard will not work. Um, there are many uh, different uh, firmwares out there. You have the ZMK, QMK, whatever MK. Um, generally, all those firmwares um, work on the same like process flow that you can see on the right side. So you, all your firmware will initialize to your peripherals, then initialize the USB stack, and then you have like a main loop that will run continuously. So this main loop will scan your keyboard, um, detect any press keys, and then it, it will send the, US, the required USB packets. And then, of course, after that, if you have, let's say, a knob or a screen or whatever funky thing you want to put inside, for example, Python, um, it all will run on the others. And this will run like many times per second. So, of course, for the best customizable experience, consider rolling your own hardware, rolling your own custom firmware because you are able to tweak everything. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to the next step. Uh, this is the probably the meat of the talk, um, which is how to actually design your boot circuit board. Um, of course, please don't click on auto route. Auto route is for lazy people, and it will cause you a lot of pain during the debugging process. And you would have to rede redesign your your layout multiple times because auto route is bad. Okay, so um, used to be a pen and paper process. Um, nowadays. We have powerful PCs, and so we can do all of these like on your your home computer. So um, the most common um, EDA uh, PCB design software that you can use and find are EO, uh, which is an Autodesk um, ecosystem software. So um, unfortunately, like you need to buy a license to unlock all the features or abuse your educational um, privileges. So um, we have uh, KiCad, so um, KiCad is the one that I use. It's free and open source, and it's actually um, very powerful. And we have um, Altium, so Altium is the one that uh, is used in industry. Uh, it's unfortunately very expensive, and it's full of um, features that you will never use. So for the CAD, we have uh, Fusion 360. Um, here again, free for education, uses Autodesk. Um, we have Blender and we have FreeCAD. So um, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, in my experience with the keyboard making community, they tend to not use Blender or FreeCAD because it causes them a lot of pain and suffering, um, probably due to support and whatever. Of course, um, once you decide to sell your product, um, you have to consider the licensing requirements because you can get like into trouble. Okay, so. Um, for the workflow of um, the of designing your PCB, it generally goes like that. So first we have the logical schematic, so um, effectively the circuit diagram for keyboard. Then we have the footprint assignment. So footprint assignment is basically assigning um, each uh, physical component um, to your uh, symbol. So each symbol on your logical schematic will require a footprint. And each footprint like will represent its actual dimensions on your uh, physical layout. Next, we have the part placement. So part, part placement and trace routing actually come hand in hand because that's where you place all the different components laid out nicely, and then you wire all of them up together. Um, and then on the other side, once you're done with everything on the left side, then you start to have your design rules checking. So design rules checking is um, a process where 
the system will check that you have all of your um, routing um, done properly. There are no shorts or no potential to cause any like circuit shorts. Um, all of the trace width and spacing is proper. So when the when they actually go to manufacturer, the, um, they will just like take your design and put it into production immediately. And of course, production file generation. What your what the factory needs to produce your printed circuit board. Okay, so this is the core of your keyboard, the keyboard matrix. So, um, because you have so many keys and you only have so many inputs on your, on your microcontroller, you have to use a keyboard uh, matrix in order to handle that amount of um, inputs. So, in general, what you do is you would um, turn all of your rows into inputs and all of your columns into outputs. So what, it, what this means is that um, the output from the microcontroller it's when you when you turn it on, then you have a key press that would um, send the signal to your inputs, and that's where you read. So, the different number of bits that you read um, based on the number of pins would be your the key that you press. So, um, I'm not going to talk about ghosting because it's a bit of a pain to explain it here. But generally, um, ghosting is to um, prevent the prevent any inputs from being um, um, like. Okay, so ghosting is to prevent the inputs from being misread. So, like if you press a key, uh, the ghosting will happen, and it, and you think it will think that you are pressing multiple keys at once. So, a, a rule of thumb that, that you can use when you're designing your matrix is that the closer your matrix is to a square, the less number of inputs that you you require. So, for example, in a sixteen key uh, matrix, if you take an eight times two. Uh, rectangle versus a 4 times 4 square, um, the number of pins that are required for the square is lesser than the rectangle. Okay, so, um, yeah, before, before I go on, your matrix can have holes in them. Um, this is totally fine because your key mapping can be done in your software. Okay, so um, the, the, your circuit diagram, also known as your schematic, um, this is where all your functionality and connect connectivity of co your components are. Each component is a symbol, as I explained earlier, and then the, your PCB design software will basically use the information to um, define constraints that will, that will be used during the footprint placement. So you won't have like the problem of you have maybe 200 inputs and 200 different components and you have to wire them manually. Uh, it's much simpler than that. So before you begin, please use a common dimension system and stick to it because mixing imperial and metric units are a pain and if you don't notice this early um, your production is going to screw up as well okay so actually I should like show you guys like directly within the, the tool itself so um, here is an example of the schematic diagram So um, I'll just talk about the matrix first. So um, yeah, the matrix looks a bit dense, but it's effectively a matrix for uh, 104, 108 key keyboard. So each of this is a switch. Each of this is a switch, and then we have columns and we have rows. So what I mean by gaps is that you can have um, unfilled um, parts in your matrix that you can put in your keys. And then uh, these, all of these can be handled in the software alone. So in your firmware, you can say that your, you only have like maybe 10 out of 12 keys that are filled in, and then your, and same for your columns. Okay, so um, next would be the microcontroller. So because in my design, I decided to be lazy and just use a off-the-shelf um, microcontroller, um, what, what, the good thing about this is that you basically can abstract away all of your all of the parts, all of the supporting circuitry on your microcontroller because it's all provided for you. So here um, I basically map all of the columns and rows to the different inputs. Yeah, yeah so all of, the, all of my columns are on the left side and all of my rows on the right side. And then um, the other stuff are basically for like the screen I put into my, into my device. But generally, um, what you what you would need to do is wire the um, your input to five volts, 
you acquire your ground, and then the rest is um, depending on your design. So um, just now I, I explained a bit earlier about converting your um, converting your signals. Um, so this tiny thing here is basically um, what is known as a level shifter. So it would take in your uh, input at like 3.3 volts, and then it would output it as 5 volts. So so that your uh, peripheral can consume it. Okay. So um, once that's done, yeah. So yeah, next one is the footprint. So the footprint is actually your physical representation of your component. Uh, you have your pins, you have your 3D model if applicable, and then you, of course you have the dimensions as well. So based on your shopping list or your bill of materials, um, you would then select the footprints that are relevant. So um, for example, if you have a resistor, but a resistor can have different sizes. You can have those that you know with the, the metallic legs, or you can have these tiny rectangle things, uh, like these. So on the left side, you have um, surface mounted components. They are very tiny, uh, like less than the size of your fingernail. Um, and then you also have your traditional um, true hole components. So um, some people um, prefer to have it all hand soldered, so they will use more of the right side than the left side. And, but of course, you can also hand solder the left side. It just takes more time and patience. So um, while you're doing the layout, um, please ensure that the, your factory is able to handle the uh, PCB that you like assembling. So for example, if you have all your components on both sides, and then you realize that your factory only can do it one side, then um, be prepared to, to redesign the entire um, circuit board. Okay, so um, next, I think I'll just talk about this directly on the tool itself. So, okay, so for this is the keyboard, uh, the actual like PCB view. Uh, it looks very complex, but I assure you, it, it isn't. Okay, so I'm just gonna hide the bottom layer first. Okay, so um, each of this, uh, yeah, each of this thing, like. This is this one square. This of this is actually one uh, keyboard switch, and then um, yeah, this these are like RGB components that I've placed on each switch. So um, all of these will be routed to your microcontroller itself. So this thing here, I'm using a Teensy. So as you can see, um, this is actually how your Teensy will look like if you buy one of it. Um, it's dimensionally accurate as well. Uh, so this is about like um six cm, so it's about six cm like like that, okay. And then um you will do all your routing. So routing is basically like, for example, if I were to take out this thing. So um all you do is literally just draw a line. That's that's the routing process. But note that I cannot connect to any other pads. That's because it's been predefined in the schematic. Um, so all you have to do is like literally connect the dots. Um, so you will have like a top layer and a bottom layer in general. So because most of your PCBs are dual layer. So generally, uh, rule of thumb is that you can design all your traces that are on the top layer to be horizontal and then on the bottom layer to be vertical because this would help you a lot when you're doing like, um, when you have to cross layers. So for example, these things here, these, these, these little pads, these are called vias. So um, a via will basically allow you to traverse from the bottom layer to the top layer. And, and if you don't do your layout properly, you're gonna find a lot of routing problems where you have to make a lot of different vias just to go like up and down, up and down, up and down within the board itself. So um, once all of that is generally done, you can actually make like a, yeah, you can actually just like view it in 3D. Hope that it runs. So yeah, um, you can actually, yeah, so this is actually how the PC build would look. Like you can see all the different components. So. For me, what I've done is I've moved all the ghosting um, diode things 
on towards like this part and then leave the rest of the wiring like through the rest of the board. It's not the best design but um, To this, um, of course, when you're dealing with um, very very dense um, designs, for example, if we were to design, let's say, a piece of desktop RAM, then have like 32 layers of PCB, so that's like a lot of stuff to do. But otherwise, um, the general principle of like designing your PCB is the same. So um, when you're routing, um, make sure not to create any circular loops within your design because each loop that you make is uh, an antenna, e effectively. And this would um, allow you to pick up stray signals and cause all sorts of funny signals inside your, inside your circuit, which is bad. Okay, so we move on to the silk screen layer. So this is effectively a printing and labeling layer for your printed circuit board. So if you decide to bling it out, you can use this layer to put all your custom designs. So um, this on the right side was a PCB card that I made for uh, UQ Smack. So it's actually made by taking like a vector art and then just putting it on the design and then playing around the layers to make sure like you have the color variation. So um, you can do something like this for your designs. Okay, I think I've talked about this already. So yeah. Okay, so um, design rules checking. So this is the fifth step. Um, once you have completed all of your wiring and all of your routing, um, you would basically run this tool every time. Um, this tool would check for any of your stray, um, any stray pads or any wires that are not connected and would tell you that you have done something bad. It also check for clearances. So if you put two traces too close to each other um, and your rules are that you need, to, you need them spaced um, apart, um, then this would actually uh, tell you that you need to do so. So if you don't, like if you screw up, then you have to fix it manually, I guess. This is a prototype, this is fine, but when, when you actually make a product, um, this is bad. Okay, so um, the last step is to generate your production files. Um, so the factory would basically take all three of these um, files, your, your Gerber files, which contains all the traces and pad um, information so that they can like make a uh, make the actual print, I guess, and then the drill, which is the positional information for all your holes on your board, as well as the cutout, and then the centroid files if you need them to do the assembly for you. So they'll just put all of these into their giant machine and out comes your keyboard. So please remember to check the requirements because not all factories make the same, make, do it the same way. Okay, so um. These are some of the uh, manufacturers and vendors that can help you with like your like prototyping and buying your parts. So um, JLC PCB is the one I use. Um, they can, I think their current pricing is five pieces of PCB of size 10 cm by 10 cm is two bucks. So building a large, like maybe 80 cm wide um, printed circuit board and five pieces of it will cost you about 30 bucks. It's cheaper than I think most what most people expect because of their scale that they produce these things at. Um, there's also Oshpark and PCBWay. Um, I, I, I'd say that they're a bit more expensive, but their, their, their build quality is a bit more premium as well. So um, when you need to buy electronics for your keyboard, like all your different resistors, capacitors, whatever, you can use um, these um, different like vendors. So LCSC is a, has an integration with the GLP, GLC PCB. They're effectively the same company. So you can buy all your parts from them, and then when you do the assembly, the assembly itself, they can just pull it out from their stock, and then just do all of it within the same factory. You also have DigiKey, uh, Mauser, um, RS Online, Arrow. So these are all like more uh, international uh, brands. Um, and of, of course, if you don't want to make like do all the soldering, um, or, or you don't want to pay for them to do a soldering, you can do it yourself. It's totally possible. Okay, I think this part I'll just talk to you using Fusion. Okay, so when you're modeling your keyboard, um, like, so this is my keyboard, for example. 
Um, all, the, all the dimensions, um, please make sure that they are accurate. So you can import like the model that I showed just now into, into this thing. So this would effectively give you a base that you can start from. And then after that, you just like take all the different um, parts and then you just place it to make sure that your design looks uh, as is. So if we zoom in like into one little key, so underneath this thing here is the switch. So models such as these can actually be found on the internet. Um, other people have already done it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so all you have to do, get like find a model, um, hopefully it's free of charge and no license requirements. Drag it into your design and then you just place it and copy it. And then, yeah, so once you have that done, then it's a matter of like just placing it properly and then you can like check how your keyboard looks like just by playing on one of the colors, like, uh, yeah. yeah, I can't do it right now, but otherwise, so you can also design, um, yeah, this is the, the plate itself. So this plate is basically the frame where all of your switches sit on. Um, you can have it, you can choose to not have it, that's up to you. Um, this plate itself is exported from the keyboard layout editor, um, converted into a drawing and then just extruded. So from a 2D drawing, all you need to do is just pull it out a bit, like maybe 2mm, and then you have your plate. Okay, so um, in general, the modeling process is more straightforward because all of the dimensions are already fixed in some way, and you just need to place all your parts on it. So once you have this, then um, you can like generally get an idea of how your keyboard will look in the end. Okay. So of course, your your keyboard modeling will help you with all of these. Uh, especially if creating a case of a keyboard. And then, uh, yeah, plate itself has already been explained. And yeah, so this is very important, so dimensioning. If you require them to, like a manufacturer to actually cut your keyboard out for you, let's say the case or the plate, um, you need to produce one of these. So um, the rule of thumb for these is that each um, like measurement that you, that you need to make. For example, the cutout of one switch, uh, you have to um, put in the dimensions for that. Uh, the width between switches and any, any additional components such as mounting holes and also of course the general size of the keyboard. So um, the manufacturer will take this and put it into their machine basically. So if this is not accurate, then your the machine will just like produce garbage. So please triple check the units of measure. I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay, so I think I'm close to the end of the talk. So how much did it cost me? Um, so because uh, producing stuff in small amounts is very expensive due to setup. So for example, producing the plate itself cost me like 200 US dollars. So one plate is about 40 bucks. If you realize like, let's say if I were to produce like maybe 50 plates or 100 plates, the co my cost per plate would basically drastically reduce. Um, the PCB itself is not very expensive, like 20 bucks for five and for a really big one. So the components and assembly, because I decided to have the factory do it for me, uh, cost me about 80 bucks-ish. But I, I think I only bought the components for one keyboard because I didn't need five. So um, because I decided to use uh, off-the-shelf uh, microcontroller cost me about 30 bucks and then accessories such as screws, um, bolts, um, the screen on my keyboard uh, is about 40. So the estimated price is about 220 bucks. So it's maybe I guess on the lower end of the of your keyboard space unless you like buy those really cheap ones or those that they make in like thousands and then they sell. Okay. So um, some of the useful resources, so while you're here in UQ, do make use of the Makerspace. The Makerspace is a very uh, well-equipped like facility. I think it's just like next door uh, in the Mansur Shore building. Um, the Makerspace has all sorts of uh, fabrication equipment for you. You have 3D printing, you have laser cutting, you have um, metal turning and whatever there. 
So of course you need to do all the induction courses before you're allowed access to all of those. So um, do visit it if you have the time. And um, you can grab your Autodesk education license just by signing up with your student email account. So please make use of it. The, you have paid for all of this in your school fees. Okay, and then um, some of the um, wikis that you can use. So the AIO3, uh, this guy, uh, he basically made like a document that a lot of people use nowadays and build their designs upon. So you can visit this um, and then you can find like PCP design guides, um, case design guides, keycap design, all sort of things, including a list of the parts and footprint library that you can use. Um, so this one is a new one. Uh, is So some other hobbyists um, decided to update the, the design wiki with current current information so you can use that as well and you can visit the keyboard atelier discord um, that's where all the professionals and uh, hobbyist makers come together exchange ideas so it's not a, it's not a place where people bash each other's ideas but where people help each other of course there are a few snarky people there so that's unfortunate but that's every discord so yep I think that's all um, and of course this is the keyboard like I'm just gonna walk through the camera so this is the keyboard that is complete I guess um, I tried try to make it as, as close can you focus it okay so um, unfortunately I, did, I didn't have the time to program it fully but I, I actually intend to have like all the configuration software on that yeah but otherwise this is the keyboard uh, it's actually quite FT I'll, I'll pass it around if you guys want to take a look at it but so yep it's quite accurate to my 3d model so I hope I've done everything right I guess so yeah so yep I think that's all and yep I think we can break for pizza I don't get angry. Producing the printed circuit board actually takes the factory about three days because they do it in such a high volume. Um, shipping itself, um, we don't talk about shipping. Shipping is very variable. Um, yes, so in general, I think maybe I can like build one of these in one month. Yeah, conservative. So that's about the time it can take. Of course, I have no idea why. Um, if you buy one of those group buy keyboards, you can take like maybe several months to maybe a year to wait for your product to come. Um, I guess they have their own limitations, but I will not speculate. Yeah. So you have a question in the back? Uh, I might have missed it, but why did you choose the Gen Z over like a Pi Pico or something? Ah, okay. So I guess that was on a whim. So I, so actually right in this keyboard, um, itself, I I was planning to write a bit of a uh, graphics interface for this part, and I have a Micro Python instance actually running on this board as well. I have no idea why, but I decided to have it for fun. So um, it's also an accessibility thing, I guess, because like I could walk into a store and buy one of these um, off the shelf rather than order it on Amazon or whatever. So yeah. But I guess no, not nothing that is very like design related. Okay. It's just on a whim. Okay, um, question. I was also curious. Um, the plate being like two hundred dollars. How did you like get the plate, and how is it sort of machine? Because it's quite expensive. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find the document itself. So what I did was um, this thing. I exported it into the drawing file, and then I just shipped it off to uh, one of those manufacturers in China they, and then they basically quoted me and like give me all the 
details. Let's see if I can find it still. Uh, yeah. So this was what they gave me. So aluminum material, um, natural color, which is the silvery thing. Um, and then like sandblasting treatment. So I think it's laser cut or water cut, mm. but it's very uh, accurate. I think you can come over and see later. Yeah. So um, I guess their quality is very good for prototyping. So, yep. Yeah. So you're a 0 0.5 millimeter radius stuff. Mm. So like that would be the uh, machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess it's, it's good enough. Good enough, good enough for, for me. It's, it would not be super accurate, but as long as you can fit all the stuff, it's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. yeah. How comfortable would this use and have to take that to account? You can come over and cop a few for it. Everyone's got it, Okay. Um, any quick? Yep. And this is a bit out of scope for the talk, but how did you choose which heat switches? Ah, okay. Uh, again, that is a uh, price thing. I just look on multiple vendors, I decided to use, uh, I think these are uh, creamy yellow Garerons. So because they were cheap and in bulk and I needed something to test really quickly, so I just bought the cheapest available and same for the keycaps. These keycaps come from uh, some random AliExpress shop. <laughs> so it works really well, uh, so I won't complain. But if you were to come over and take a look, you will realize that I think some of my keys are like rotated. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, any more questions? Peter is a few minutes away, we just wanted to grab at the pizza.